we've heard this early afternoon, two keynote, um, at, uh, no, uh, two keynote uh, speakers talking about online teaching, and we will now have um, here the, the, the space to discuss also in a critical and reflective way um, the issue or the topic of data management, because this is also part of research. We've all experienced um, during the pandemic a boost in online teaching. We've heard about it, all the opportunities, of course, which um, this has given to us to continue also our international collaboration. But there's also um, a boost in data management, in uh, the digitalization of data collection, management, storage, and distribution. And of course, this has also not just technical implications, of course, but also implications regarding um, yeah, our ways of knowledge production, and uh, particularly in a, um, in a uh, community like that, where we cross regionally come together yeah and we have uh, people coming from experts coming from uh, countries partly with uh, colonial with a historical unique experience and a colonial legacy that is also reflected in the way we produce knowledge and there's something um, we as uh, scholars of cultural, cultural studies, sociologists, deal with for quite a long time, which is a decolonial turn. We talked about the spatial turn, the material turn. There are lots of turns around, but there's also a decolonial turn when it comes to international cooperation, also in higher education. And there's also a, de a decolonial turn or a decolonial thought in data management and data collection. And this is kind of what we try to touch upon, even though, well, I'm not an expert in that, but I would really love to talk with our esteemed uh, panelists, um, experts who came uh, here to Bonn from all over the world. And I'm very happy to start to present our first panelist, which is uh, Susanna Barrera. And uh, now I need, I need to read your, um, your profile, even though we know each other from our DSSP bilateral graduate program. But uh, I'm very happy um, to have you here today. Um, Susana is a geogra geographical engineer from the university, Universidad Jorge Tadeo Lozano in Bogota with a master's degree that she holds in water resources survey from the International Institute of Aero Aerospace Survey and Earth Sciences in the Netherlands. Very international and very interdisciplinary. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, she um, is a PhD candidate in geography um, in, from the Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. And since 2018 and until 2022, you've been um, the director of our bilateral partner, the Institute of Environmental Studies, IDEA, uh, of the uh, Universidad Nacional um, in Colombia. She has worked as a professor at the geography department at the same university since 1995. From 2021 onwards, she, she, you work uh, at the Faculty of Arts, School of Architecture and Urbanism. And, um, well, she's a director of the group Estepa, Space Technology and Participation since 2005. You're really an expert in, in, in these topics. So I'm really very excited to listen to you. Um, yeah, this group brings together students and researchers interested in the implications of the concept of space and the management of territories, its participatory management and perspective. Um, yeah, you're, you're an, also an expert in GIS and cartographic representations, territory and landscape studies, diverse territorialities, and gender rights, and so on and so forth. So I'm really happy, Susanna, that you're here today, coming from Colombia, the only uh, woman also in this panel, because it's not that easy to find um, an expert, a female expert in, um, in data management. 
Um, the second panelist, I'm also very happy. This is the first time that we meet, but anyways, I'm very happy to um, welcome also Dr. John Jolliffe. Um, he studied chemistry at the University of Newcastle uh, in the UK and then moved on to the University of Oxford for his PhD studies in the field of organic chemistry. So different um, disciplinary setting. After postdocs in Ox Ox Oxford and TUM uh, Munich, um, he spent some time in the pharmaceutical in industry as a project manager. This is also highly exciting because they deal also with data in a different way, I can imagine, than, than universities. Since 2021, he's a project manager for NF. D14 Chem, where he is also heavily, well, this is an initiative to build an open and fair infrastructure in uh, for research data management in chemistry, and it's probably just for chemistry, huh? or you will later on um, uh, uh, elaborate on, a bit on that. Um, yeah, with the NFDI, he also coordinates a working group which focuses on the non-technical reasons that are holding people back from publishing their data, such as error cultures and pressures due to the pub publish and perish par paradigm. So kind of you're familiar with the topic, with the topic of fair, equitable, and yeah, access to data and uh, information. Welcome, John, uh, to this panel. And last but not least, I want to present my um, friend and former colleague at CEF, now at IDOS, uh, Antonio Rockmann. He studied geography with a focus on landscape and water ecology, as well as development policy at the University of Bonn. Besides, he worked as a student assistant in a com company for development in geoinformation system. Somehow, yeah, the geography is your disciplinary background. After his studies, he worked for several years at the Institute of Geodesy and Geoinformation at the University of Bonn in the context of a public-private partnership on the development of geodatabases and geoinfrastructures, among others, um, for the municipal cadastral system. So you have international uh, exposure, and not just in Africa and Latin America with us at CEF, but also in Germany. So this is... Uh, exciting. Afterwards, he worked in a landscape ecological planning office on projects for the revitalization of ri river systems. In addition to his work at CEF, he spent his last year at the uh, Institute of Geography at the University of Bonn conducting research on the reintroduction of salmon in German streams. So from the ecological point of view, you can also contribute quite a lot. Yeah, uh, since 2021, you unfortunately moved to IDOS, to the German Institute for Development and Sustainability, where you are now the data manager, uh, management, or, and you build up, you really build up a data management system in this very uh, renowned uh, institute. Okay. Um, we will have um, kind of, or we will organize this panel in such a way that we will um, have three rounds of uh, questions, and we probably might start with um, giving you also the opportunity to reflect a bit on your access approach to data management systems, data management, and how do you touch upon the topic within your institute? Maybe you can just quickly or briefly um, explore a bit on that. And maybe we will start with Susanna. Um, okay. Ah, yeah. uh, the idea is just to tell you what we do with that data exactly. at the institution. Because I now did that, but I hope that Okay. Okay. The last thing, and I think the the important thing for this meeting, is that we uh, did um, an environmental system um, for um, having, uh, and, and it was work with you, <laughs> with Antonio, uh, and the idea is that this environmental system. Um, keeps the information that our uh, PhD still students and our master's students are producing. This data system is not only related to spatial uh, data, but also with alphanumeric data. And the idea is that we can share this data between us. 
Um, we have been thinking a lot about that because we are not only dealing with quantitative data, but also with qualitative data. At this moment, we have been uh, working on qualitative data because this is in somehow easier because we can just uh, go to uh, ESOS. Uh, ESOS is a word. Uh, standards. Okay. So to ISOs, sorry, to ISOs. <laughs> or, or we can go to ISOs in every sense. So, and we, we go also to thesaurus, we go to catalogs. We go to many issues that have been developed uh, within different disciplines. So um, librarians, they have been working a lot on that, as well as, as computer sciences, and as well as different topics. So then we have different issues and different standards for all this information. Um, we need to have software, we, ha we need to have hardware, and these things are open because we have thinking of all these uh, issues also on, on money, etc. cetera. Uh, but we have a, um, a huge, huge challenge with um, a qualitative information and also with uh, the information and the data with the, which is produced in local environments. Local environments not only mean uh, uh, persons, but also means all the indigenous people with different kinds of knowledge. And we know that there are lots of uh, uh, argues between what is scientific and what is not. But we also know that there are lots of impact of these small projects that people do just locally. And that because we sometimes academics are so uh, arrogant, they don't look at them and they don't see what they have done. So we are just discussing these kind of issues. Yeah, thank you so much, Susanna. I, I think we will we will uh, uh, catch up later on on some issues that you just mentioned. But I think uh, local knowledge standardization and how this is kind of uh, compatible. These are questions which we kind of should really address in this panel. But uh, thank you so much. We will come back to that later. Please, John, maybe you want to continue. What does data management mean? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll keep it uh, fairly brief because literally all we do is data management because we are a data management organization, right? So I could probably go on for a, a couple of hours on that topic. So uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so NFDI for Chem, we are trying to enable chemists to actually practice data management without them having to invest any more time, right? Uh, and the reality of this is that you have to digitalize the whole research data lifecycle, right? It's it's not that feasible to take your existing workflows and then try to make them fair retrospectively. It's way too time consuming. You need digital tools to do this as they go along. For example, electronic lab notebooks are really important for that. Uh, we are developing open source electronic lab notebooks so anyone can use them. So there's no pay barrier behind using these tools. Uh, we have open access repositories where people can publish their data from all around the world. So again, there's no paywall behind that as well. Um, and then, of course, you need to have uh, standards to be developed, standards with respect to data quality, with respect to um, data formats, uh, not just for data, but also for, for, for their metadata. Um, and then also, how do you publish data? What do you publish? How do you publish it? These are all very complicated questions that are taking place on the international context and there we're also heavily involved in important organizations such as the IUPAC who actually define all these standards so um, I think that's kind of a, a rough uh, sketching out of what we do I'm happy to go on uh, many of the the details in more detail but I think um, I'll, I'll leave out that for now. Yeah, maybe you can quickly respond to a, a follow-up question what would be the matter of concern, you're really coming from data and you're doing nothing else than that. What would be the main matter of concern in your uh, everyday work? Main matter of concern for me personally? As a data manager. Well, I'm not a data manager. So basically what I'm, I'm trying to accompany the, the change, right? So that people who are working, let's say in the analog ways with the pen and paper, how do we get them to the future, right? How do we get them to work digitally? How do we get them to publish data? And it's a multifaceted problem, not just technical, but also uh, social issues as well. 
Okay. Yep. Thank you yep. for now for this uh, uh, overview and maybe we can just continue with, okay, Antonio, what would... Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm currently working since one and a half year at the German Institute of Sustainability and Development and trying to set up there uh, to introduce research data management services from the bottom up. Also, there's nothing what was before. So also in Germany, you have the problem that this data sharing, data documenting, um, making open is more or less a new development in comparison, for example, to Anglo-American countries. So, so many researchers in our institutes here are not really aware about the implications and demands, which are now more and more given by this paradigm of open science, open data, and is more and more required also by the donors to make the data open and accessible and reusable, following the FAIR principles, for example. I worked, before I started there, I worked at SET, it comes not to me the clear out. I worked a lot in projects with African partners, for example. And we tried yeah, to, to, to develop systems to be usable or to be used later on by the African partners. Yeah, and I've learned a lot regarding the very um, ethnocentristic view on the possibilities which are there in such a country in order to run, for example, systems which allow to share, to make open the data they have also created. Only one example, we came up with a concept for grid-based data management systems um, interconnecting several institutes with their infrastructures, but we completely oversaw that the internet connection is not capable to that. These things, for example. Yeah. Um, however, now I try um, to, in this new institute, is very important. And when you ask me what are the main uh, challenges when implementing such services, is to, in a certain way, convince researchers about the benefits they will gain when they also invest a certain amount of capacity development and also time in standardized data, prepared data, and so on. It's the main challenge. And now I'm trying to do it in a participatory way. We're developing strategies together with research data working groups, together with scientists, but also the facilities, the departments which are going to provide later on the services, IT, and so on. I'm trying now to develop such strategic goals late on which, on this base, we will later on then develop concepts on how to implement services and infrastructures. Even though we are also in the moment trying to implement infrastructures and so on in face of a weak IT in our, in our institute and so on. But that's what I'm doing in the moment. What I've learned really is from the, my experience working in, in, in CEF is we have really from the beginning trying to, to raise awareness about the benefits and the needs for research data management yeah, and also yeah, include and really understand the demand from the research sites yeah. Also later on regarding uh, when you're in the field, how to collect data, issues like data protection is quite important for us because we work a lot with qualitative data, interviews and so on, to raise awareness on how to manage the data in a way that we later on, the society, we serve as scientists and scientific communities will benefit from this effort. Yeah, thank you so much, Antonio. I've, we've had a lot of long discussions at CEF, and uh, I think um, when you talk about convincing researchers, we always have, of course, also these researchers with, with very different uh, um, disciplinary backgrounds. And I would like to deepen a bit... Uh, oh, get some knowledge from you about uh, how to deal with qualitative and sensitive data, because it is really an issue. And particularly, Susanna, when you're talking about, uh, yeah, okay, we are mainly working with quantitative data because it's easier, yeah, you, you still have the qualitative data and the no local knowledge that you also want to include is an issue, yeah, and how to deal with this knowledge without, uh, or remaining the protection or um, uh, respecting the, the, the protection of the respondents, of course. Maybe, I don't know, Susanna, from your Colombian experience, maybe you can elaborate a bit on that, how you protect the respondents, those who are giving you, and the researchers, and the respondents to the researchers that give you this qualitative data on rather sensitive uh, topics, yeah, like, for example, environmental conflicts. 
<laughs> I think we have to, to think in many issues. Um, who makes the data, what for, and why? So you have to be clear on those issues. Um, what are the implications of those data? Because even though here in these spaces we talk about academic and our responsibility and things like that, the world is out there. So then there are many people who want those, those data to do whatever they want and to, well, many people can be, a, how do you say that? Um, it can affect some people who, who has taken so specific data. So we have to deal with lots of ethical uh, thinking when we use the, those data. So not all the data can be just be published. Of course, this is another ethical question, who, are, who I am to say this is public and this is not. But I think all of us has to deal always with issues which are really contested. So for instance, in our country, we, ha we have just signed the peace uh, agreement and we still have lots of fights and lots of injustice and et cetera. So it's not a matter that, okay, I have the technology, I have the money, I do this. No, it's an ethical issue. It's an ethical issue and a responsibility with, with the communities. So who can have access to those data? What for and why? Sometimes those data is, are just for the same communities to between themselves know what to do. So that's what I really think that participation is very important. It's not a matter that I take the decision to do that, but we have to make decisions together. And of course, to the people who was making those special data. And we have to listen and we have to know what to do with that, with ethical and knowing that we are in a conflict area and that it can cause lots of problems for some people. Um, well, yeah, yeah. But also we have found that because of this unjust <laughs> world, there are some times that those uh, data are very important to uh, Plato's uh, plights, fights, because then we said, people said, no, this is my land or this was the land. And because we have historical data that had been collected in different ways, then this can prove that the land belonged to some people who has been just moved out to other areas. So we can use this data also for adjusting issues, but it's a little bit dangerous sometimes. So I think the ethical issue is there. So you asked us a question which was very hard for me at the beginning to, to respond. You said that data is a matter of concern or rather than a matter of fact, I think both. And it depends on the type of data. Some of them is a matter of fact, but some others are a matter of, of concern. And, and, and only one person cannot take the decision. It has to be, it has to be something, uh, participative. Yeah, thank you, uh, Susanna. I think this makes things clearer, but it comes to a next question for me. I, data management is a discipline as such, and kind of, you mentioned it, it is everywhere required, yeah? But it needs a lot of capacity building. Uh, for the researchers as well, and maybe John, I don't know, but uh, uh, probably you made some experiences in that. You need to teach the researchers also how to deal with these, these different kind of data in a fair and equitable way. Um, that's a very good point. I mean, that certainly at undergraduate level, there's a, a massive lack in data literacy teaching, right? Um, if I look at the chemistry undergraduate curri curriculum, not much is uh, taught in terms of digital literacy. Um, and it continues when they go to, into the lab, into the postgraduate degrees. They still work, let's say, like you worked, well, from a data management uh, point of view, very much like in the 1930s, literally documenting pen and paper, and then these people go into industry, and then industry is like, what are you doing? You don't know how to use an electronic lab notebook, right? So there's a, a, a big uh, gap of um, skills here. Um, I want to point so something else out, though, is that very often 
fair and open get confused. They're not the same thing. You can have fair data that isn't open at all, right? You can have fair data that is subject to embargoes. And for us as the NFDI, first and foremost, we want data to be fair. We, we, we would like data to be open, but we don't necessarily see that as an absolute must. There, there is some data that under no circumstance can be open, as you just mentioned, but you can still have fair data that is, um, that, that is not open. It, it just has to be subject to an appropriate um, uh, embargo. Could you describe that a bit more? What is fair data that is not open? <laughs> well, I mean, fair is an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, right? So uh, through the R, that would just be read, that it would have a very restrictive license, right? Um, uh, for example, we have a repository called the commotion repository where people can publish their experiments and then they can, for example, set an embargo, okay, this data can't be published for, uh, for 10 years, right? Because then um, it might be, so sensitive that other people could use it then to, to gain an advantage and scoop their paper, for example. Right? So in, in chemistry, there is not so much the issue that if you publish the data, somebody could do something really bad with it, but it's that somebody could take your data and basically beat you at your own research, right? right? Or even beat you to the punch uh, in getting a paper published before you get it published, right? So, but there are mechanisms to have fair data behind um, uh, access restrictions. And that, and that is important to, to acknowledge is that we're, what we're trying to achieve is to have the, the data somewhere that in the case it is needed, it can be accessed, but um, subject to certain restrictions, right? And this is something that is very often confuses people think, DFG wants me to, to do fair data, but I don't want everybody to see my data. That's not what it means. It, it merely means that the data is structured in such a way and archived in such a way that the access is then clearly uh, regulated. And then when people do want to access it, it's not entirely unusable. Right? That's, what, that's what the FAIR principles stand for. Of course. Um, do you also deal, well, coming from chemistry, do, do you also deal with sensitive data in that sense? Um, sensitive data with respect that it might give someone a competitive advantage but very okay. little um i mean surely there'll be some people working on let's say chemical weapons or something like that but that is just such a, a small percentage of, of researchers that and especially not in an academic context right so the the majority of people in academia won't won't be working with sensitive data in, in such a respect that it can actually have some uh real negative impl implications for people other than themselves because they might lose their academic competitive advantage. Okay, thank you. Uh, you also mentioned open data and I was very uh, thankful that you came back with a comment and also an additional question uh, on open data management and how open data management can be designed, distributed in uh, uh, or to people, different interest groups, uh, different disciplines, and, uh, and uh, yeah, in how this can be organized in such a way that also different views are reflected. And I think this is a very excited, exciting question and not yet solved, but maybe you have some ideas about that. As a problem is really when you want to share data also first, you are right, yeah, the, the, the first rule is as open as possible, as close as necessary regarding fair data. Also it doesn't mean to have to share all the data you have, very, very clear. Um, I think the problem is especially when you, when you work in, in, in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary environments, that you have in one side of the community uh, so an implicit knowledge also about methods about methods in creating data, in quality management and assessment and so on, which are, is then community driven. And then when you make the data open to other communities, which have not completely, but different methodologies, methodologies uh, methods in, in working with data, in assessing data also regarding their reusability in, uh, in, in these questions, then you might have the problem that you are not understandable, even though if you provide the metadata, yeah, a point is, for example, you have the rule is in research data management when making data open is when you are a scientist, you have to provide data. First, look as a disciplinary repository. Yeah, where the data are, for example, structured, modeled, and de described in a way which are then fitting to the type of data, more or less. So, and then when you don't find such a repository, then look for a generic one. So such a rule, yeah. You have also generic repositories where you have yeah interdisciplinary data sets, 
yeah, which more common, common metadata standards, which are not so much tailored to describe specific data characteristics coming from one discipline. Yeah. And this might is a problem, of course, I think. Yeah, this understanding um, of data provenance, for example, uh, for uh, somebody who's working with interviews, qualitative interviews, and doing maybe then some text analysis, transcriptions, and so on, and somebody who is doing yeah, measurements, for example, yeah, of physical, physical phenomena measurements, yeah, using several software softwares in order for processing the data, analyzing the data. And when you want later on to explain somebody who hasn't worked, for example, with hardly or software-driven data analysis uh, so much as, for example, a natural scientist, to explain them to somebody who isn't aware of this or familiar, familiar with this, how you can trust the data, the quality of data, because we have described all the processes, then it might be difficult for the recipient from another discipline really to assess if the data is useful for him or her. That's what I see, for example, as a problem. Um, yeah, Th thank you, Antonio. Um, I, I have the feeling that, okay, we depart from a common understanding that has been taught in our universities and uh, kind of, uh, of course, well, in particularly in Latin America, we are talking about pluriversities and there's a lot of resistance also against this kind of data extraction. It is, it is uh, um, there's a concept talking about data extraction and I think I think this really holds uh, true for different disciplines not just qualitative data from anthropology yeah which is of course a, a, a synonym yeah for data extraction but also in chemistry or in geography or doesn't matter where we look at yeah we go into I don't know, uh, communities, we uh, need this data, we uh, process this data, and all of a sudden we realize that we have taken something from someone who was not included, who couldn't participate. Do you deal somehow with these issues as well? Maybe Susanna. Um, with me first. <laughs> comment, what? No. <laughs> yeah, well, I go round, around, around, around. Um, yeah, when 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 we when we uh, think about um, uh, critique on uh, the, the collection of data the way we approach communities. We, uh, of course, ah, yeah. we as academics from universities, we also we all share the same standards, but others don't. We again come back to different forms of knowledge production and the co-production of knowledge is key to more integration here. And this is, of course, also data manager, the data is not uh, there as a, as a given, it needs to be collected and then processed and, and so on and so forth. And how do we ensure uh, the, the, the participation, the communication, the integration of those who might also at one point in time claim pop property rights? Again, the same. I think I, what I think is that we have to think of what we always think is what for, data are for whom and what for, for, for what? Then, okay. Again, there are some research data and journals. Uh, there are many, many types of data, chemical data, physical data. What, what, uh, I work with cartography, so spatial data, social cartography data. So then I also work with issues like place, like space, like habitat, <laughs> lots of issues like those ones that some of them are easier to put in a data management stuff like that, but others not. How can you put social cartography and the intention of people to draw some issues. Well, although I was reading on this page of Love Data Week <laughs> and they already have a standards for that, or you already have a standards for that. So then you send metadata, then you describe, make an abstract of what you are doing and things like that. So everything is so organized and so on. 
where is the context? And I also was wondering about colonialism. If you think on colonialism is something that we from Latin America really believe it is there. And I don't think it's only Latin America, it's also Africa. And it really exists there. So then how can we deal with those issues? So now, okay, let's say all of us are going to make these environmental systems with computers and so on. Who provides for the computers? Who provides for the technology? Who pays for that? And who are the people who is going, taking some benefits of those small issues? Of course, it's, I'm just being so redu reductionist in that because there are so, so huge issues that we can also get benefits from, from these things. But this dependence on technology is still there. So then you believe when you go to our places and you walk through the ter territories, you said, oh my God, these data issues and these computer things and these fights that we have in the in the in the in, in these academic areas, they they don't go really to our needs, to our necessities. It's something quite, we live in a different world. It's it's real. And I don't think this is bad. What is bad is that we all want to universalize the way we are living. So we have to think about what is development, about what we really want, and about our ways of living. Because if we at the universities are always saying to people, no, we have to, to be very, very data and technology, uh, technology driven, and we go to our territories, then the people from our territories, they are always feeling like we are not seeing the things that we do, they don't work because we are always looking, it's, it's colonialism. It's incredible, it's colonialism. So then there are other ways to think of data sharing because what for do we, do we want that? I would like to have data sharing to learn how in Africa you make different things that we don't know how. And maybe you know, you, you would love to do that with us. We are in similar situations. But if we come here and see how the transportation system is, and we compare that with ours, or all the computer things, we will always say, well, we will never reach that. Is that what we want? But the, the, the problem is that this is in our minds. So then I think that these data issues has different issues on colonialism, on ethics, on imagination. And I think many of, many of the issues I have been thought about, uh, technology, they are already written in this <laughs> Love Data Week. I was just looking through that and I said, okay, this, you already thought that. Yes, oh yeah, they already did that. Okay, they did this. Even the qualitative data, because you have a special issue on qualitative data. So I was wondering what they have. And as I told you, they said uh, context, well, and things like that. And when you go to the uh, Horizon 2020 grants, they are asking you for some issues also to feed those environmental systems. So for whom? For the people who is working and trying to live differently. And we are academics, but we also come from those regions. What, do our, what are we doing? What is for one part and what is for the other one? I think we have to wonder on that. Um, when you go to communities and you find that they are really related related to nature. They really um, find that nature is your sister and your brother. And I came, I come to spaces like these academic areas. You will, many people will laugh at me and will say, what is that, Susana? This is not scientific. This is not scientific, but this is the way it is. And who says that this is not scientific? Then you go also to the academic things and you begin to read about colonialism and you understand that these issues are also colonialism and that we ourselves do, do, they do that to ourselves. So I think this is a, an issue that we really have to think of. And I would love to share what we do in Latin America with people in the same situation as us. Um, Last week we went, I'm going to tell you something fast, sorry. Last week we went to Valle del Paran area in, in Colombia and we found such a beautiful um, project in aquaculture 
with indigenous people, with their knowledge, they have a thinking area to see how nature fits them. And they have also aquaculture with different technological things, with agriculture, and they were feeding lots of students of the community in a place that is full of conflicts between our government and the local people. These things exist. And the nicer thing was that the guy, the indigenous, he went to the university and he was saying, I was reading and I found something similar in Africa. And then I thought, I, 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 le I learned about that and I built one in the same way that in Africa they do that. And it, it was there, so I have pictures of that. And we were like, oh my God, this is what data is needed for. We have to learn from the others like ours. From, and, and from other ways of thinking, of knowing, not only these research things. I understand that chemical issues are very important. And of course, I understand that physical and medical. I went to this data and you have a lot, you have in medicine, in chemical, in, and I think this is good. And all the, the work that librarian, librarians have done on thesaurus and so, on and so on, that's important. And what we have made with our environmental system, which is very small, is important. But I think we have to deal with that. We have to think about this and how to do it. Maybe movies, maybe TikToks, <laughs> maybe just going there. So some people go there and just talk to the other one. And maybe this is much better than to have that in a computer. In some areas where we don't have even internet, even cell phones are very difficult to, to, to charge because we don't have even electricity. So then what are we talking about? There is no one word, there are many words. Yeah, thank you. I think you nicely illustrated that it is highly important to have this diversity of knowledge, production and exchange. And of course, all these processes are always situated and need to be contextualized and uh, accordingly reflected on. But I don't know, maybe we can pass to John and you also thought about the idea. Yeah, OK, what does it mean for my discipline now to avoid the risk to reproduce also colon colonial practices and we are always talking about international uh, cooperation yeah we need to yeah we depart from this bilateral graduate program and of course we every day have uh, these issues yeah or have to solve also these i guess from a um, chemistry point of view it's it's very largely um, a matter of money Right, because chemistry is incredibly expensive to do. So even without data management, there already is a large uh, north-south gap, as you, uh, as you said, because you need extraordinary amounts of money just to do simple experiments. Right, um, um, the the standard machine to do the most simple measurement will already cost a million euros, for example. Right, so chemistry is incredibly expensive to do the science, uh, and actually. The, the data management aspect, the cost of that actually is very negligible in actually doing the, the science in the first place. Right? Um, but of course, there are, I, I actually think there are ways where data management can actually save money for smaller departments in the global south in the long run, right? For example, um, if the data is available online, they don't have to reproduce an experiment on one of these experiment uh, expensive uh, instruments uh, because instrument time costs money, uh, they might have to use liquid helium to run the instrument and if they can save that one single experiment right that already saves money if you save a thousand experiments over a year that saves a lot of money so again if, if data is available for reuse it can actually save a lot of resources now the important thing here is that the solutions to research data management aren't uh, prohibitively expensive right so um for example electronic lab notebooks it, we have to at all costs avoid that a a single or maybe a handful of uh, commercial uh, solutions establish themselves and then the, the the free solutions don't survive right so there need to be free uh, solutions available so that people who do not do not have the funds to pay uh, let's say hundred thousand euros a year for an electronic lab notebook license that they that they still have a sol solutions to do it and then also the the people that provide the repositories where you can deposit the data that that's also possible 
from all around the world, right? So it's not just, okay, we've we've done this repository, it's only for a select group of people from a select group of uh, a region of the world. No, this is a repository where everybody from the world can deposit their data, right? So if you then have free software, that just helps you structure your data, and then you can dump that data somewhere where you don't have to pay for the, um, the hosting of the data, then that can actually um, save costs for you in the, in, in the long run. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Of course, this is a very particular yeah. uh, example, but yeah. still, I think uh, it, it's quite exciting to to get some glance on on also other disciplines. Antonio uh, and Antonio, um, maybe as a last question also, and then I would like to open the floor for others because you've all made your experiences, but you've made a lot of trainings. I know you 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 traveled through the world and made a lot of trainings. What was your impression and how were these trainings on data management systems? Yeah, uh, taking the example from our Center for Development Research, German uh, universities and institutes, what were your uh, experiences there and how do these people take this uh yeah this experience also I, I one thing which i was really surprised about is that um the openness the willingness to whatever reasons from for example students uh, in west africa which have been part of our project to make to share their data as far as possible also positive data is always a topic um was quite high whatever reasons so i i what i would think is from their perspective is okay i provide data i provide insights and so on for my country for my livelihood yeah to scientists one are ourselves and other scientists which are in the so-called developed countries but they have much more resources and possibilities to exploit scientifically this data yeah and on an individual level a scientist who has with well equipped resources in Europe can better foster his own career yeah by exploiting this data as somebody who is in a university in a more or less poor country which doesn't have the resources for example for doing their own research yeah if not uh, germany comes and pays them fees for for uh, hiring a, a, a high, a high processing computers in europe or something like this yeah a complete dependence on that how what can be made with this information okay in the training itself okay this is not also awareness regarding the benefits of, of uh, um, data sharing um, are not be transferable in one or two sessions i think it's a question of culture the question of really experience, yeah, the benefit of having access to data, which for me is an advantage because I don't have to recollect them, for example, yeah, as a scientist uh, in the countries in which I have been working and so on. And so I think um, it was an openness, but um, I don't think this was very sustainable. Also, I think in the projects I've worked, the implementation, the goal to put the systems yeah, to the local area that they can manage on their own is not makeable in a project of three or four years. Yeah, We have really to invest more in that and we have especially to really get reflections from their side, what they really need. Yeah, what they need to do and not coming up with ideas and if you want to get part of the project to get some grants more or less more or less a bit yeah except how we are going to use data for example yeah because our donor want to have the data so and so so i think there's more is, is more conversation needed more voice needed what i wanted to say also regarding the the question of influence of the not developed countries, I don't like this term, you all, you all, we all don't like the term, is um, the voice rising. Uh, we have many initiatives globally, for example, Research Data Alliance and so on, which try a bit to develop not only standards, procedures, guidelines, and so on, on how to manage data on a more global scale. But if you look at the membership list of the working groups, we have mainly to 90% scientists from the so-called developed countries there. So I don't know how to organize this, but we need more voice. Okay, we have the care principles, for example, yeah, These principles which which reflect the needs of indigenous communities. 
Yeah, care principles, you know them, I think. And so the, this is claimed that uh, the control of uh, data created or coming from indigenous uh, communities should be kept under their own control. Yeah, and should yeah, uh, um, serve to their benefits, especially. And so on. there are guidelines which are not legally binding. So there are developments of the Global Indigenous Data uh, Alliance. So yeah, where they are trying to influence the way how this openness of data is claimed over the world, yeah, without really reflecting the needs of, of uh, other societies which are not Western, Western, uh, yeah, conditioned. Uh, yeah, thank you, Antonio, and uh, I think you gave us now the. Uh, um, invited us to open now the floor when talking about we need more voices and I think to get now these diverse voices I would like to open up um, the floor for you to also ask questions in case you have because it's a unique opportunity for you to ask now this round of uh, experts. Thank you. Um, I thank the panelists and uh, also Eva for wonderfully uh, organizing the panel discussion. I think it was uh, informative, to be honest. Um, saying this, um, I still raise a kind of provocative question, uh, or, or which might help us to discuss more on, I mean, to, to implement it in the real world. Uh, fortunately, I had also a very similar conference in Addis last week, and uh, we were discussing about data sharing and all this issue, and a lot of scientists were discussing about the challenge in, in doing so. Uh, my question to, uh, especially, um, yeah, I think some of you can respond to this. Um, data is a resource. It's a big resource. It's so important. Uh, Possibly you can call it renewable or unrenewable resource. Uh, it's expensive as any resource we can talk. Um, sharing this resource, do you think is so easy? Um, in one hand, um, some data may not be usable if you just use it by yourself, unless it is combined and uh, pull it together. Big data, the bigger data we can have is um, it makes um, the science more stronger to predict the future. I mean, the science should predict the future in a, in a way that we can solve the problem of today as well as the future. And for this, we need big data. There is no question about it. We have to share data. I can give one example. Um, I'm in Clive Food and uh, my background is more on agriculture, but I like the data we are talking about the climate. So the climate change we are talking in Ethiopia or in East Africa is not only caused by the climate the information we have in Ethiopia. The Pacific can influence us. The Indian Ocean can influence us. Nearby countries can influence us. If this all data cannot be shared and put it together, you cannot predict seasons properly, for example. How is the next season going to, to be or look like depends very much on how precise your prediction is. And for this, you need a lot of data which should be pulled together from all the regions. And in this case, you have to share the data. It doesn't make sense to only have it in Ethiopia. It has to be shared, no question about it because we are sharing the same climate. But are all data like this? There are also secretive data, which might have a lot of political implications, which might have a lot of issues, legal, whatever. So my question, sorry that I'm having a very long statement. My question is, what kind of data can really be shared still among us? When we are talking about sharing data, the data can be shared between institutions within a given nation, or it can be shared between nations, right? So don't you think that we need a legal framework, maybe among state, member states like the UN, I don't know, so that you know 
we, we get to consensus that yes, this kind of data should be shared so that we, we live in, a, in the same environment, in the same globe that we have to bear the, the challenge as well as you know, the opportunities that might come due to this uh, resource. So this is a very important resource, valuable resource, like any resource we are talking about. And can this resource be shared very easily? And don't you think we require a legal framework for it? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, from my side, I'm looking at it from the angle of um, sustainability and um, looking at from what Susanna said, data should be shareable to enable learning and co-production. So my question will be looking at the SDG in terms of the economic perspective, social perspective and the environmental perspective. If we shift a little from the economic perspective, which is the income, the resources from data, looking at it from the social perspective and the environmental perspective, do you think we can share more data, even if we don't share all for economic purpose, but at least for social good and um, environmental good, maybe, um, for instance, Africa is termed as, on, I mean, then we, we don't really have much information in Africa, even though they have uh, human resources, but they don't have the skills and the techniques. And that is because there is a form of knowledge that is lacking. So do you think from social perspective, if this knowledge is shared a little or the data is shared, maybe we could come to at least at par to a certain level. And secondly, where does AI fit into all of this? So recently we have chat GPT everywhere and people use it for research now and they also acknowledge it in uh, discussions. So how do we now um, talk about chat GPT, which is giving a lot of information and it doesn't really have the right data to, for the information that it shared many of, most of the times. Thank you. Okay. Later on, you will come in, okay. yeah? Okay? We still have the time, please. Who wants to respond? Who <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> well, fast. Definitely, the climate data should be shared. It's, it's, we can make modeling, we can make lots of things. In fact, there are many models running and that's why we have we have the, the possibility to predict. And these models had have to be fed. So I don't think we have any discussion on that. Those are just facts. Uh, the, 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 the question was concern or fact. It's a fact, I think. Those types of, of data have to be shared, and we are doing that. Satellite images, with all that uh, models, ensembles, and things like that, there are Perfect, and they are so cool. I, 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 in, I really enjoy seeing that and see how to make uh, forecasting and things like that. And we, we, we are able to predict many things with that. So not about, uh, about, about that. But, the, uh, well, and social, in social issues, we also have different things. For, a, for example, a cadastral, you, uh, when you, you work in cadastral. Cadastral is a, such an important issue to know in countries. We don't have that because there are lots of political issues behind that. So these are topics and issues that we have to deal with in poly, well, but it's not as simple as taking a rainfall uh, data. In cadastral, there are more issues and political issues going around. So, but definitely I think this type of data we, we should know. And, um, and you, you talk also about uh, sustainability, well, income data. There are some data that I think we, we, we should know and they, they, it should be there. The thing is that um, we have to think how and, and to think on ethical issues. 
how to how to deal with them we as academics and and and, and yeah how to put them in an in a system knowing that anybody is going to take them and anybody not only means academics it means enterprises it means research well other people so then the, this is my point yeah let's conclude but what, what you have said uh, regarding social data um of course you can for example if you collect social data, you anonymize the data in order to meet data protection demands. It's always an important issue, depending a bit also of the consent you have, if you do yeah, social qualitative data, for example, or service, household service. We have gotten, uh, gotten consent from the interviewed persons, but you can make with the data and whatnot. You can apply, for example, a license which doesn't allow for commercial use, reuse. It's possible, Creative Commons license, for example, for such data sets. However, you never know what happens with the data. If we have uh, in countries which have, which want, which use this type of data, um, for social control and not for the benefit of the society. This, yeah, not only com uh, commercialization, but also for other purposes. Yeah, in extreme way, we can see it in China, for example, where it's a total control, social control of the of population in order to have the power over them. Yeah, and this is a question where I, I don't know ways for that, yeah, how to manage it. It's in the, in the end, a question which has to be answered by the researchers, of the groups, yeah, trying to create a social data, yeah, or social science data, they have to to do this this uh, this decision on an ethical review, for example, yeah, we have to regarding your colleagues, the partners, on how you can avoid that a harm is uh, then uh, produced by this information for those who have given the data. Um, and this is a difficult, difficult question, of course, but I think social data are quite useful for many things in development also, and should be as far as possible shared as long as we have really thought about also possible negative implications, and you can manage it by ethical viewing on it and data protection and so on. So. Um, I can maybe just touch on the, the, the machine learning uh, AI aspect of things. Um, I think this is incredibly important and is actually opening up a whole new area of science, which is really exciting, that you can actually now do some things in science that you wouldn't have been able to do before because you didn't have the data. Like um, um, we have a researcher in our consortium who predicts certain molecular properties, and he does this by feeding the AI with a whole database. Um, and, and then he gets molecular properties out, out which can be directly used in the development of drugs, right? And that, that speeds up uh, the process of drug development, for example. So you can actually have real world benefits, right? Um, uh, and in actual fact, I mean, the, this, this is not something entirely new. I mean, certain types of data have been published for ages. I mean, in, in, in chemistry, uh, X-ray crystallog crystallography data has been published for 30 or 40 years. It's just the other types of data that haven't been published. And those types of data have been used in the development of drugs. Um, so why not the, the other types of data? Um, uh, and what we've actually found is that very often it's why people don't want to publish their data aren't for technical reasons. It's, it's not because they say, oh, it's too expensive or it takes too much time. It's very much for, for human reasons, right? Because they are afraid of exposing their self, themselves to greater, greater scrutiny, right? In, in academia, we have a terrible error, error culture. Someone has a, a retraction earlier on in their career. It can mean pretty much the end of their career. They'll, um, they, they'll struggle, struggle to publish in journals somewhere else. Uh, they'll struggle to secure funding, right? So the way we deal with retractions in academia as a whole is certainly not very healthy. Uh, and then also researchers aren't working maybe as diligently as they, they, they ought to because they're under so much pressure to publish as quickly as possible, as much as possible in higher impact factor journals as possible to secure funding that they might take certain shortcuts, which doesn't necessarily lead to the best research practice, right? Um, and again, if they publish their data, they'd expose themselves to greater scrutiny where these practices would come to light. We all know these things happen, you know, like I'll just show the spectrum from one to 12 so you don't see the dirt at zero, for example. Uh, if you just show a picture from one to 12, that's fine. But if you actually publish the more data, people would see the dirt. So these are real systemic issues that are holding people back, right? It's, 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 it's not so much the technical things, it's really 
um, systemic problems that have gone on in science for so long and you know have just been kind of accepted as the status quo people just pretend they they're not there but now data publication is becoming more mandatory they're harder to ignore and that is actually why people don't want to do it right very often and then when you start talking about these things oh so suddenly people get interested right so I, I think these issues need to be addressed far more than than the technical challenges right is is, is these systemic issues we face in the first place. And again, that the, the, the root cause of this is the way um, research is rewarded and the re way research is funded. That has to fundamentally change. Reward-oriented academia, which could also be in, in one or the other way be criticized and a product of modern binary thinking, just like talking about natural scientific data, which is a fact, and social scientific data, which is always a concern. This is a mo modern binary thinking as well. But anyways, there were other, other, other questions. And I think we should take the last, I don't know, five to 10 minutes. Excuse me, you? Yes. Um, thank you. I would like to ask my question from the statement of the third um, speaker where he stated that there was a significant willingness of students from West Africa to share their data openly. So I would want to understand, uh, I would like to know if you have considered um, the benefits of sharing data to the person who is creating that data. Have you come across that? Because um, I guide students in their research data processes and um, consistently we come up with the questions, we, we come across the questions as to what benefits would they have if they shared their data openly or to within certain specific parameters. I would like to know um, how best, or if you've, uh, how best to put it to them as to the benefits of putting all of that data within the acceptable and ethical parameters that is. I hope my question is clear. Um, I still want to add to her. And uh, to, to add up to what she said, I would like to know how you deal with ownership of data. Maybe one, one more, Michael, and then we close. Yeah? All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll ask my question, then I explain a little. Uh, shouldn't we be concerned, and I mean more concerned about the negative impacts of data protection, just as we are enthusiastic about uh, its benefits. Uh, as the panel rightly stated, many of us in the uh, Global South, some countries in the Global South, struggle to come out with resources to do research. Now there's the added burden of putting up uh, some framework for data protection. That means that the gulf is widening and the cost of research is increasing. That is one side of the coin. Uh, it also tends to create a gulf in terms of the quality of scholars that are emerging uh, in some countries in the global south. Because some journals now want to see a data protection framework ethical, for ethics we understand, but also data protection uh, framework. So at the end of the day, if we can come out with this framework because we do not have the resources, we end up publishing our research in maybe some lower tier of journals or uh, outlets, not because our science is not good, but just because we do not have resources to meet the new stringent data uh, protection requirements. So my question is, shouldn't we be equally concerned about that? And shouldn't we drive that point home that it is a double-edged sword that cuts both edge deep? Thank you. Uh, would, I, would I first, because I was directly addressed, is this Anya, no? um, to your question. Uh, this is my, my personal experience I made in a huge African project with doctoral students. So what I tried is to, to uh, explain them that, for example, also individual benefits, 
yeah, can be, for example, to be cited as a good data provider. It's also things which can be a personal benefit, the personal career. Then also clear, the program, puts, the program wants to have it in this way, yeah, that, that the data should be accessible for, because it was a graduate school, yeah, graduate school was for following, for following uh, generations of students, that they can have access to the data. So you provide then uh, resources for your followers. Yeah, and they will be happy then. And logically, one has to start with it. But as Rucha, a database is meeting topics of a program or an institution. Yeah, as Rucha it is or larger it is, as more benefits later the users may have from it. So, so how I tried to explain that. So I was not, I didn't feel resistance on that, even though I clearly know that this is a resistance I feel every day in my own institute. But we have to invest, what do I get back? Yeah, so this is really a huge question, but it might be also different as you know quite more about this than I do regarding that. Regarding ownership of data, um, you have to, depends a bit on the, so, on the, yes? This is what I was thinking, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, regard, oh, sorry for that. Uh, regarding um, ownership, yeah, it depends a bit. Also, um, if you are a member of an institution and you have in the working contract something uh, um, stated that the results of your research, even though you might have your rights for first uh, publication rights, embargo, and so on, but in general, the data is owned by your employer. Yeah, this is also, this is in many cases uh, the case, then they can decide what shall happen with the data by respecting your career demands, by respecting also uh, um, your ethical and data privacy issues. So, but I don't know, I can't give you any information how it is in single national, single nations or countries, our regulations are there, institutional wise, for example, I can say for my institution, for example, say was with University of Bonn, it's the same, yeah, where we have elaborated a data policy, the data is in the main owned by the institution. Yeah, and they have the right to decide what will happen with it by very important respecting all your rights. Yeah, you have looked for your own career publications on and later on, but I cannot general, general, generalize it to other institutions or countries. Maybe I can throw the cat among uh, the pigeons there. Um, it really depends on, on the type of data, right? Um, so for certain types of data, and, and again, this depends on which country you live in, but for example, in, in Germany, certain types of data are not subject to copyright. Nobody can own them, right? So um, for example, certain measurements in chemistry, they're not copyrightable, right? Just as much as you can't copyright the, the temperature outside today, right? You can't copyright them. But what you can do is you can state in an employment contract with the university, I hereby agree to that I will not publish these data without my employer's consent. You, you can do it that way around, but you cannot go via the copyright rule or have a legal recourse there. And that's really important to consider, right? It doesn't mean that you, you can stop your PhD students from going away with the, with the, with the data and then publishing their, their, their research by themselves. It just has to be done in, in a different legal framework and copyright is not necessarily the, the right legal framework for that. That's just important to bear in mind. Yeah. But you also have the so-called sui generis rights. Yeah, it's a question of investment in the data you put, even though the data, the fact itself, hasn't, hasn't any copyright. So if you have huge investments in creating the data, you might then also get a certain type of ownership. It's also maybe to, to add to this question of copyright, not copyright. <laughs> um. What I think is that all these issues are really difficult and we are not going to solve that here. But what I think is that we can make a part of that, <laughs> solve a little bit. <laughs> How? Um, we are in an academic context. So then from our context, which is here, the academic, we have to teach and we have to discuss and we have to really be concerned about all these issues in the way that when we go and work to, to, other, uh, to, to different places, we know what can happen, can happen with those data. So I really think that everybody has a responsibility. I have a responsibility as an academic, but when I go and work in the in field work with, 
with communities, I also have a huge responsibility with the community as, a, as an academic and so on. Um, I think it's different, because, uh, I don't know. We in Colombia, at least we have lots of, of, of laws and policies, but it's very easy to go just, uh, nobody pays really attention to these kind of things. So that's so hard. Uh, because you can have the best regulations ever, but these things are not really interiorized by people, so then they do whatever they want. So then I, I think that the first, the only thing we can do is as a person, as a, and as a students, and as an academics, work really hard on teaching what are the advantages and disadvantages of these kind of things? And not only just to go and produce data and to share to everybody, but to think about that. And I am concerned here with other things because we are always, we have been since modernity, <laughs> making that the division of, of, of qualitative and quantitative or social and, and the other issues, scientific, well, and although social is scientific as well, well, you understand what I mean. But if I think in chemical issues, I, or, or I can think, for instance, in something very, very technical, such as the, the um, um, transform, um, energy transition, energy transformation that we are going on today, then, okay, in Colombia, we can say, okay, no more water hydropower. Stop with the hydropower. Now let's go and find coltan because we need coltan or some minerals it's chemical or some other issues which are in different areas. So then the thing is that not that the people, the geologists, they will say, okay, the, the minerals are in these and these areas. And because I am the, from the hard sciences or from the scientific uh, area, they I won't care about what is going on with the extraction of those minerals in those areas. So I really think this is a huge problem for us that we have divided all the knowledge in quantitative and qualitative, even I began talking like that. But then I think we have to sit down all together and understand if I have to produce these glasses, where the glass come home, come from, and if I need to produce some water with bubbles and things like that, that you do, how, where do we get the water and what are the implications of these things in social issues? So we have to sit down all together and to begin transform the way we are relating to those data and to those systems. And maybe, uh, well, I was reading a paper that with, um, artificial intelligence the thing is that is made by us so i don't know how 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 intelligent it can be with all these issues that we are just dealing here but we had to feed those artificial intelligence not only with data or facts facts but with other things that can also decide or where take some points or, or, or show some issues about these coltan or minerals or, or, or not only the chemical chemical because this is not only alone everything is related so what somebody said at the beginning that we have to think in complex systems is real we have to think in that of that and we have to think of that not only with mathematics and things like that but sit sit down here and think about everything we are doing and you social and you statistical and you engineer, chemical, let's say what is going on with this and how we are affecting people and what we want for our places to be. I think it's that, but I don't. Yeah, thank you, Susanna. And also for your questions, uh, thank you to all of you, I think to uh, be open to come to this panel and uh, respond to, yeah, questions that probably have not been that you have not touched upon before um, I've learned a lot um, I hope you did as well and what I take home kind of um, is that from the beginning when we decide which data needs to be collected the collection of data as such the management of this data and processing distribution and so on data there's a lot of human 
activity involved. And I would say there's no neutral objective there is, but not just because it is also a matter of construction and also of social construction. And I think even when we talk about technology, even technology is not neutral or objective. There is also a lot of social construction involved. And as long as we, I don't know, take this into consideration, always when we engage in cooperation or cooperative uh, research, I think we probably be more prepared for also all these bottlenecks that we might face. 